Welcome to the new series, which is going to be about generating the microcode for the SAP 6502. In this video, I'll go over a little bit of the background first, then I'll show you how to download and compile the microcode generator. I'm releasing the code up front so that you can follow along and play with the code at home yourself. But this whole series will really be about how the microcode generator works, and along the way, we'll be going over all of the 6502 instructions. Even if you never plan to build your own TTL CPU, watching this series should still give you better insight into how these 8-bit machines worked, and specifically the 6502. The idea was to take the Ben Eater implementation of the Albert Paul Molvino SAP1 design and add some muscle to the bone, enough to make it execute 6502 machine code. The hardware is being built in a companion playlist, but here the idea is to go over the software side of things, specifically the microcode in the controller sequencer. I view the sequencer as being a bit like a puppet master. It pulls on a bunch of strings in the right order, and it brings the puppet to life. I go over the hardware design of the sequencer controller in a lot more detail in these three videos. Links provided below, but I'll go over some of the more important concepts again now. The sequencer takes a high level command like sit down, it breaks it into a number of steps, and by pulling on the strings appropriately, it gets the puppet to perform the action. A different instruction, like get up, results in a different sequence of actions, and a different task is performed. When we carry this analogy over to the computer, we have a W bus which connects all the devices. These devices are a bit like the limbs on the puppet. And there are control signals coming from the sequencer controller, which coordinate the flow of data through the machine. Let's say we want to execute the TXS instruction, which is stored in main memory. This just transfers the content of the X register into the stack pointer. In step 0, we enable the static RAM and the buffer that connects it to the W bus. Then on the positive edge of clock, we transfer this information into the instruction register, and because of the way the machine's wired, this gets presented to the sequencer. In the next step, we enable the output of the index X register, and on the next positive edge of clock, this gets transferred to the stack pointer. The design of the sequencer controller culminates in this architecture that we see here. What we're interested in now is the code that goes inside this bank of EPROMs. Each micro instruction is just one 40 bit word, which sends control signals out to the rest of the machine. Before we look at the microcode generator, I want to go over the fetch decode execute cycle, which is a fundamental feature of von Neumann architectures. The 6502 falls under this category. Essentially, we have a loop where we go from fetch to decode to execute, then back to fetch in an endless loop. This Wikipedia page actually sums it up quite well. Let me read aloud the relevant pieces. During the fetch stage, the next instruction is fetched from the memory address that is currently stored in the program counter and stored into the instruction register. In the decode stage, the encoded instruction presented in the instruction register is interpreted by the decoder. If the instruction requires it, this is where the effective address is computed. For indirect addressing, the effective address is read from main memory, and any required data is fetched from main memory to be processed and then placed into the data registers. In the execute stage, the sequencer passes the decoded information as a sequence of control signals to the relevant functional units of the CPU to perform the actions required by the instruction. The fetch decode execute cycle is controlled by the sequencer, but how does that relate to the architecture that we've built? Well, the address lines on the EPROMs in the sequencer come from three sources. The instruction register, the sequence counter, and the CPU flags. We'll just ignore the flags for the moment and concentrate on the instruction register and sequence counter. We can form this two-dimensional array in the EPROM where the instruction is the index across the top and the step is the index down the side. Fetch occurs in step 0, and the code is the same for all the instructions. In fact, the instruction register will contain the opcode for the previous instruction, but because we've made the code the same for all instructions at step 0, 
this doesn't really matter. This is also true for Benedict's SAP1 design. In step zero, we perform a main memory read using the program counter as the address. We set the W bus to high impedance, which means none of the internal registers should be writing to it. We load the value from main memory into the instruction register. This, of course, goes via the W bus. Simultaneously, we increment the program counter at the end of the micro instruction. Decoders next, which occurs at the boundary of step zero and step one. This happens automatically just by presenting the value in the instruction register to the controller EEPROM. Effective address calculation and execution occurs between steps 1 and 23. I've shown it as execute here, but really it can be a combination of decode and execute depending on the instruction. The important thing to note is that all 256 possible instructions can have their own unique microcode sequence. Each instruction can have a different length of microcode, and at the end, they all jump back to fetch. We need to have a reset sequence, and this is between steps 24 and 31, and like fetch, this is the same for all instructions. Rather than handwriting all the binary for the microcodes the way Benita did, I'm going to write a program that directly generates the microcode. I'm going to use Apple Win as the basis for the microcode generator, and it's an open source emulator for running Apple II programs under Windows. In fact, you could argue that I'm writing the microcode to be compatible with Apple Win rather than the 6502 itself, but hopefully there's enough overlap between the two that it doesn't matter. I've provided a link below to the Apple Win repository on GitHub. It emulates both the 6502 and 65CO2 as well as a number of peripherals mentioned here. To get to the source code, you need to click on the release notes link here. The stable release link only contains binaries and no source code. Scroll down to the bottom of this page and download sourcecode.zip. This procedure is likely to change over time, so if it doesn't work for you, just check the comments below for the updated process. I've downloaded this zip file, which is version 1.30.11.0. Now I'm just extracting it to its own folder. There's a Visual Studio 2019 solution, so I'll click on that. I'll start at compiling, and there are really only two files I need to worry about. One's called cpu.cpp, and the other's 6502.h, which contains the emulator for the CPU. Now, I'm going to leave 6502.h untouched. In fact, this is our reference design. But let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. Generally speaking, there's a common structure you'll see for emulators written in C or C++. First, there's an outer loop. It's an infinite loop in this case, but sometimes there are constraints. Next, we can generally identify a fetch of some description. This is where data is fetched from main memory, stored in the instruction register, and the program count is incremented. After that, we have some kind of switch statement which decodes the instruction. Then each case clause generally refers to a single instruction. In this case, it calls another routine which performs the execution. Here in the Apple Win code, we can see this do statement which forms the outer loop. A couple of lines down, we see this fetch subroutine call. Actually, I think it's a macro, but this loads in our opcode. Next, we see this large switch statement with 256 case clauses. This does the decode. Some, but not all instructions then do effective address calculation. And technically this is part of decode as well. Finally, every instruction including no op performs some sort of execution. Apple wins cycle accurate, so it keeps track of the number of cycles per instruction, but the SAP 6502 isn't. All right, that seems to have compiled. Now let's see if it works. There we have it, Apple II Pac-Man. You gotta love it when it works straight out of the box. Now we need to download the new copy of cpu.cpp, which contains the microcode generator. This can be found at GitHub at Turing 6502 slash SAP 6502. Then download cpu.cpp, which is the only file there at the moment. Next, go to the Apple Win source code directory. Rename cpu.cpp to something else. Copy in the cpu.cpp from the GitHub repository. Then go back to Visual Studio and recompile everything. 
Once that's done, run it and see how it goes. And there we have it. Apple II Pac-Man running on the SAP6502 emulator with the microcode that we plan to use. You can put in a breakpoint and stop the code. Then single step through it and inspect the variables as you go along. There's about 1,500 lines worth of code in the microcode generator. And if you want to actually output the EEPROM, you just need to change this write EEPROM variable to true. Otherwise, don't forget to like, share and subscribe and press the notification bell. If you do download it and get it to run, leave a comment below and tell us how it goes. Similarly, if you have any problems, leave a comment as well.